Okay, George, if you're ready, I'm ready. I am ready. Excellent. Hello and welcome everyone. This is Free Your Mind with Dr. Sheena Mason, and I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with George Middleton today. Um, George and I met, I don't know, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. I, I don't know how long it, it, it's been. I feel like time is blurring into time itself <laughs> uh, but it, it feels like we've known each other for longer because a lot of the ideas about race and racelessness that I have um, I find that resonates with George and also aligns with a lot of work he does in the deracialization space. So George welcome to the show um, the floor is yours. Welcome uh, thank you and thanks for having me on your show. Uh, this is a highlight in my evolutionary process to my ultimate goal, which it seems like we share. Um, I'm, my name is George Middleton. I uh, am a therapist and author promoting a series of works addressing the connection between the quality of our mental health and race ideology. And so I'm approaching it from a mental health therapeutic intervention paradigm uh, because it is a more effective way of having the conversation uh, often in, in conversations addressing race, racism, uh, racial tensions and disparities. Uh, it turns into an ineffective uh, process because people are coming from entrenched points of view. The therapeutic clinical process puts objectivity into the situation and it challenges others to, to uh, reach for objectivity. Doesn't mean to give up your own personal view if that's what you really want to hold to. But, you know, try to find that midpoint in which you can make rational decisions and then ultimately line those up with your values and see, you know, how much, of an, how much in alignment this race piece, this race ideology is with your own personal values. Let's talk, let's talk about how race ideology often clouds <laughs> our judgment um, more. I recently watched one of your talks on your own YouTube channel, um, a presentation that you did and something that struck me was your discussion of what, what you called the first encounter. And the first encounter is something that I've actually shared probably across all appearances that I've had of people ask me about uh, when did I learn that I was black or when did I first think about race or learn about race or more to the point, when did I first learn or experience racism? And so this, this idea of the first encounter really struck me. Um, apparently that's a thing. So if you could, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you could talk, talk to me about that, like what is the first encounter? What's a, what does the literature say about that? And is there a difference between first encounters based on different racializations? Hmm. Difference between... Difference between first encounters and, Do and racialized white people have this thing called ah, the first encounter. Gotcha. Or okay. yeah, how does how okay. do you see that operating? Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. So the the clinical term is called negrescence. N i g uh, r e s c e n c e. Hope I can win a spelling bee on that. Uh, but that's the term negrescence. And it's a, it's a concept developed by psychologist William Cross, um, who used it to describe the experiences associated with becoming a psychologically healthy black male or female in the United States. And uh, the first, it's a five stage model. So the first stage is called the encounter. And the encounter occurs when an individual is faced with a profound experience or set of experiences directly related to race that cause him or her to re-examine their self-identity. And uh, so in my presentation that you're mentioning, 
I, I use that to make a connection because often uh, those who identify as black can go back to that first experience of realizing that they, they're black. The, the second stage of that, uh, of that model of uh, uh, Dr. Cross's is called the pre-encounter. And that is the stage where individuals don't believe during that time of their development that race is an important aspect of their identity. So at some point in our early, and typically in early childhood, very rarely have I heard anyone who has been able to get to adolescence, teenager, early adulthood without having to deal with this concept of racial identity. It generally happens in your formative years uh, and you're trying to figure out who you are. And unfortunately, the going society has more access and, and input into how you see yourself then you're able to control yourself. So that whole idea of uh, the black identity. Uh, now, Dr. Cross really didn't, he didn't really take that past, as far as I know so far in my research with him, he didn't take that into any other aspect of identity. He really dealt with the racially black identity. However, in my presentations, I do make that assertion that anyone can have an encounter experience in almost any other area of identity. In something that makes you feel uh, unique or different or out of the mainstream as compared to other people. And which that's what the negrescence experience is, the encounter experience is, it sets you apart from the mainstream. You're finally realizing, oh my God, I thought I was like you, but now the way that you just called me black I, you use it as if something's wrong with me. So now you're going back doing a self-check to say, well, why can't I be like my friends? What's wrong with me being, you know, now you're, you're going down a rabbit hole of mental dysfunction at that point. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I'm wondering, so <laughs> coincidentally, um, I'm reading a book called Beyond Black Biracial Identity in America by Carrie Ann Rockamore and David Brunsma. Um, and I, I think they're field, I think they're sociologists. Um, and they did this research in 2008 on what they called mixed race identity. And the mixed race participants that they focused on were those who were quote, black and white. And they end up drawing Four, category, four, four categories in which people in that group viewed their racial identity. And the four categories include um, the single, single, what they call singular identity. So a person either identifies as only white or only black. Um, something called the protean identity, which means that the person changes how they identify on any given day. They could consider themselves black or white or biracial interch sort of interchangeably. Um, border identity, which I view as um, people seeing themselves as sort of in between or uh, uh, both. And then the transcendent identity, which is the one that I'm interested in primarily, um, which they articulate as I as ex describing people who count themselves as non-racial. And in in their explanation of how people have different ways of viewing their racial identity, part of what I make of it is this idea that if you grow up in a homogenous society, society. So if you are a racially black person in the US and you grow up in a mostly racially black town, then what you're describing as a sort of first encounter, it, it is going to look different than if you grow up in a space where there are predominantly racialized white people. Um, 
and that your family is going to be a source of the formation of your racialization and how you perceive of yourself, but that you might not necessarily have any sort of stigma or negative attachment to the, to the naming or labeling of Black that might come from an, a person who experiences explicit racism in, in a different context. And I'm thinking about that because when you're talking about first encounters, you're talking about this happening in your formative years, you're talking about being labeled and confronted with Black and Blackness and Black identity. It's making me think of the different contexts and in the different ways in which people might interpret what you're saying and what you're talking about. Because if you grow up in a more homogenous society, you might have an overwhelmingly positive conceptualization that you attach to race. At least that's been my experience. You know, I, there's a lot of talk about so-called black people seeing themselves as victims, but most of the racialized black people I know don't see themselves actually in that sort of only negative light. Um, and there's a fierce sense of pride and self-love and love for other people who are racialized as black. I think that comes out of those um, societies. But then if you grow up in a predominantly racialized white society, you might have some negative um, stigma attached with your difference, what is perceived to be your difference. What do you what do you make of that? Do you think do you think there's anything positive that gets attributed to blackness or racial identity? Or do you think that it has detrimental impacts regardless of the context? So I, I would say any and all of the above in your examples are possible uh, because those are all subjective experiences. You know, when uh, uh, one of the cognitive dissonances that people experience when having discussions on race is demanding that it's a one size fit all uh, experience. And race is exactly not that. It's, it's designed not to be uh, um, repetitive or similar per individual because the whole, the whole overall goal of the ideology is division. And if everybody's seeing it the same way and experiencing it the same way, that, that's, that creates collectivity. And, and race ideology does not work well with collectivity. It needs you to be individual. It needs you to be subjective. It needs you to be emotions and to tie emotion to it, whether it's positive or negative, so that you're not looking at the actual purpose of the ideology. So when people are speaking about race, whether they're speaking at it from a negative perspective or they're speaking from a very loving and positive perspective, they're often not speaking from the objective fact of how race itself was created and for the purpose that it was created. So, and then when you try to have, when you start to have those conversations, that's when, uh, based on that person's mindset, they decide which direction they're gonna go with regard to their relationship with race ideology. So, um, I don't, I don't dispute anyone's experience. Uh, what I do refer to is the objective data around the experience. And the objective data, regardless of whether you see race as negative or whether you see race as positive, in the overall big picture, it's negative. And yes, hey, you know, we, we are, we, we can adapt, we're resilient. You know, we can take, uh, you know, uh, a, a lemon and turn it into lemonade, okay? That, you know, nothing wrong with that. But the overall, ex the overall experience of race ideology and statistics supported, and you look at the, the going state of our country today, it's a negative, it's psychologically damaging. That doesn't mean that you can't think highly of yourself, that you can't love yourself, that you can't love others, it doesn't mean that but you can do so much more without it. As, my, as one of my mentors, Jacoby Carter, um, people who follow me might be sick of 
hearing his name at this point, but that's okay. You got to give honor to the people who've teached you, right? Or taught you. Mm. Um, he says that there's nothing inherently positive about being racialized and that in America, racialized black people have made the best of their racialization, right? And of their existence in a society that racializes them as black and by extension as inhuman, um, that people have made the best of it and have thrived in the face of, I think, attempts at annihilation and all the things doesn't mean that there's something positive about the thing um, in the be- in the beginning or from the outset. So I actually really appreciate what you said because people are and people do experience racialization differently and that's what lends to the difficulty of our work which we both help people turn a critical lens toward that thing called race right and because people come at it different from different perspectives and and very subjectivity subjectively um it, it can make people feel like you're uh, attacking them in a way, right? Or that right. you're trying to Correct. strip them of who they are. And especially if it's something that they really love, right? And honor and revere about themselves, helping people disentangle, disentangle those positive views um, to still be able to interrogate the thing in the first place. I feel like that's the biggest mountain that we have to climb. Yeah, a, pri- a prime example of that is the uh, ongoing debate about the Confederate flag. You know, we know the history of the flag, but we don't know the people's experiences with the flag. And all of the experiences are val- valid and viable experiences. They just don't happen to be in alignment with each other. And because they're not in alignment with each other, uh, you can't come to a collective decision in a way that that uh, moves the country forward. People are coming from entrenched positions. Both positions are right from their experience. If you identify as white and at your earliest formative years, you grew up in a family that had that flag plastered all across the wall and it's been associated with loving parents who fed you, clothed you, protected you, it's going to be really hard for you to be objective about that flag. You know, it's going to be very difficult for you to go back and look at the truth about what that flag represents when you have experiential data that says, my people, my my family is loving, my friends are loving. You know, uh, that flag doesn't mean that to me. And so there there begins the dissonance in the conversation uh, and because people are trying to outwin each other for their experience, for the val- val- validity of their experience, uh, never do the twain meet, never shall the twain meet because uh, you know my experience is just as valid as yours. Speaking of experiences, so traditionally race ideology in the US has operated in a way that dictates uh what it means to be black and what it means what it means to think black what it means to be politically black culturally black socially black all of that and as a result of that people who have thought outside of what we can call mainstream arenas across the board have been excluded and marginalized, uh, especially as it pertains to having alternative philosophies of race or different ideas about how to solve and resolve racism. Have you experienced anyone questioning your authenticity or questioning your experiences or saying, insisting that um, your position isn't a viable one for X, Y, and Z reason that that you find to be indicative of some of this marginalization that I'm talking about here, or, or even resistance. I, I can't say that the marginalization is um, coming from a place of malice, 
callous, but it, it happens because there are sincere beliefs and convictions that people have as it pertains to race ideology. Have you experienced in your lifetime any of that or a lot of that? <laughs> Every day. Every day. Um, <laughs> and that's why I stay in a clinical mindset. Mm. <clears throat> race ideology is an ideology replete with trauma. And when I speak from that perspective, some people get it, but a lot don't. A lot do not connect with race ideology from a perspective of trauma. But ultimately, that's what this is about. Uh, there's a lot of emotional, psychological hurt and damage associated with these issues. And it doesn't matter your social economic status, which identity you choose, uh, your, your, your occupation, your pedigree. No one wants to really talk about race because it creates an inherent stress just thinking about talking about it, which is another genius component of race. Make it difficult to speak about so that it can go on and continue to do what it was designed to do. And so now here I come and here you come, right? We're talking, well, hey, how about just kicking race down the road? How about, you know, how about imagining life without race? How about that? Now, based on that person's experience, their mindset, their psychological predisposition, some are going to say, hmm, Enterprising idea, Dr. Mason. Other people are going to go, what you talking about, Willis? Or worse. And then they do go quickly because uh, in my first book, uh, uh, Beliefs Limiting Authentic Cultural Knowledge, uh, there's an opening page on there uh, that uh, it's kind of a mantra. Uh, that goes, that says beliefs are more powerful than facts. And race ideology is a belief system. So just because you're coming from a therapeutic platform of experience and evidence-based practice, or you're coming from a PhD platform uh, with, with your, with your uh, skill set, don't think that that's going to automatically overwin a person's belief system. You can have the history, the accredited peer-reviewed documentation and research and all of that and, and set, set it down in front of a person. And if their belief set says, nah, no, nah, it's this. Your facts aren't going, to over, over, aren't going to overwhelm that person's belief system. You're going to have to use a different approach to even begin to get that person to, to see or be willing to entertain your perspective. And that's why I like using this therapeutic platform because it comes from no judgment. It accepts people where they are. It doesn't try to tell you you're right or you're wrong. It leaves the space open. As a therapist, I don't want you fighting with me. I want you wrestling with the thoughts inside of you. And often what happens when you get in these type of conversations, when you have a really valid point, the person that may, that may offer you resistance is looking for the easiest way out. If you put yourself in the way of that, you're that door out because now they can focus on the controversy with you rather than with the actual concept that you're discussing. Yeah, it's it's um, crazy making in a way because race ideology. Um, I don't know, it's it's paradoxical because we've been talking about the subjectivity, that aspect of it. But part of the problem that I recognize across time that remains true today is that some of the subjectivity masquerades itself as objective fact or truth. <laughs> and that's also what makes the barrier that much 
stronger because if you are really convicted and in, in believing that what you indeed what you believe is what is true and if you are up until a certain point unwilling to acknowledge your own subjectivity that's influencing how you're interpreting things then around the mulberry bush we go and add to that the fact that countless people with our same credentials you know i've been studying race for 20 20 years and my doctorate um has earned me the paper that says I'm an expert on all things race and racism. (laughs) And yet I look at other people with the same credentials who are saying in a lot of ways, the same thing as I'm saying, but the opposite, right? Because it's like, you know, the Ibram X Kendi's of the world, they're saying everything I'm saying about race and race ideology, but they're just doubling down on it in some really ironic ways because they haven't yet imagined a different way to do the, to do right. the work against racism, right. And help people free themselves from it. So I feel like, um, I feel like this, this idea of beliefs are stronger than facts. It's, I mean, you don't have to go far to, to see that. I see it on Twitter. I see it at every conference I participate mm-hmm. in on every panel. Mm-hmm. It's, it's constant, it's persistent. Mm. And one of the beliefs I think people have that they miss, which is why I was really excited to have this conversation with you, is how seeing oneself outside of the fishbowl of race ideology benefits everyone as an individual, right? Because we can talk about systems outside of belief systems or knowledge systems. We can talk about all of those other systems But if you talk about belief systems and if you understand the scope of how racism operates nefariously, then something like the theory of racistness makes a lot of sense because you're helping people free themselves from the strictures. Notice I'm not freeing them. They're freeing themselves from the strictures because it's a them project, right? And, And a person doesn't need to be entrenched in race ideology in order to recognize and and acknowledge the existence of racism, right? It doesn't need to be entrenched in the ideology to have an, a positive impact on, the, on other aspects of society. But I feel like people miss all the time how racialized Black people in particular actually benefit from my work. Um, Tell me more about how you've experienced the benefits for yourself in terms of deracializing yourself or how you've even witnessed the benefits that come. Okay. I'm writing as you speak because you, you're really um, bringing some excellent themes of discussion here. Um, so the first part, of your assertion, uh, seeing oneself outside of race benefits all. On the surface, that seems like a relatively objective statement uh, based on your platform and your expertise. Logically, it it aligns with with my platform and, and the goal of my work. However, that statement is based on identity. And how you identify will in large part determine and influence the way that you are hearing that seemingly altruistic benefit. The first, the first uh, emotion that a statement like that will engender is fear. Fear on two levels. Fear first of loss of identity. I've, I've, made, I've built a lifestyle. I've built a life on this identity. Now you're trying to tell me to throw that away? Are you crazy? And you call yourself a doctor? Okay. The second piece, the second component of that is how will it impact impact the bottom line of my life, 
my ability to survive. So those are two things. And it's very, it's very uh, particular, especially to those who identify as white. That be, first of all, there is a natural um, hesitance for the white identity to want to acknowledge the totality of the history and the experience past and present of race. And their lives, that's you know where this um, ethereal term white privilege comes from, their lives are impacted by it. And the white identity, and when I say these things, you notice I never say white people or black people. <clears throat> I'm dealing with the ideology and the identity. Uh, the What comes with the white identity is this a hesitance to want to really look inside that box and see everything. Hey, because, you know, right now <clears throat> my life is good. You know, I can play golf three or four times a week. Uh, I've got a nice six-figure salary. I've got my wife, two kids, and the picket fence. You know, I'm not getting stopped. I'm not getting harassed. I mean, you know, can't, can't we just move on? I love everybody. Can we just do that? <clears throat> You'll find that more often. So when you say seeing oneself outside of race benefits all, it's not going to be heard the way that you're intending it automatically by, the, by both identities, black and white. On the black side of the identity, they're going to be resistant because their identity is woven around that struggle. I've got the scars and the pain and the daily abuse that reaffirms who I am. My God has protected me, you know? Uh, so, so if you take that away, I have nothing to protect me. This is, this is who I am. And so I leave room for that person and honor that person's fear of experiences. So you have to start, you have to start where they are. And I've heard you say that several times, starting where that person is. Uh, and my goal uh, is not so much the eradication of race as more than it is to help individuals choose for themselves which path do you want to go down which path aligns with your honest views of yourself because in this work the focus for me is not the proud boys it's not uh white nationalist organizations it's not black lives matter it's not it's none of those stately groups it's the everyday person who really wants to do well who wants to treat people well who wants to love their fellow man but are in a system where no matter what they do, trauma is being inflicted. And so that, that is the population that I'm looking for. Those systems influences, those people who are providing services in all of these systems of education, finance, health, wealth, public safety. And you know, they're a service provider. If you're a service provider, you have an ethical obligation to do no harm. And so most people really want to be in alignment with their ethics of their profession, but they find when you do this study, the disparity study, they find that unique to their professions that they're inflicting harm. So how do we really begin to change these disparities? Well, you have to start with a review of yourself. How are, how, what is your individual relationship with race ideology? Yeah, I, I think one sign of my theory's effectiveness, um, perhaps <laughs> I'll, let the, I'll let the audience decide, um, but one side of my theory's effectiveness is the fact that people who are racialized as white actually more readily um, acknowledge both the history and the contemporary existence of racism from within my framework. Whereas coming in, they might initially come in the door because they're, they're misconstruing the term racelessness with colorblindness. Um, so they come in the door very happily and readily because they think it's going to be that. Uh, but fortunately, they stay long enough 
then they come to realize that it's not that. Um, and you can't read my first book, which you held up, you held up one of your many books. I wanna, I, for the first time I can hold up my own book. <laughs> So in my first congratulations. Book, oh, thank you so much, George. Thank you. It's it's so surreal. Um, in my first book, I literally apply my what I call my race in the book. I call it a race translator, but I've since renamed it the racelessness translator. And I literally focus on when race translates into racism itself for the entire book. So if you know anything about the theory of racelessness, this you being the audience, then you know that there's no hiding the fact that racism has existed, that it does exist. And yet I think that because I'm doing that analysis from a raceless perspective, it does open the door to more people to be able to have the conversations that are otherwise very challenging, anxiety inducing. You know, I did a workshop where this one young woman cried by the end of it. Um, because she was thinking about how she's passed on the trauma of racialization and stuff like that to her sons, which were around nine and 13, I want to say. And she was thinking about how can those conversations that she has with their sons and what she teaches them, how can that look and feel differently um, to their benefit? But she also came into the, the workshop disbelieving that racelessness, i.e. freedom from racism, was for her and was it, she disbelieved that it was something that was accessible to her. Mm -hmm. And when you started talking about the class aspect of this, it's like you can have um, people who are very well off, you know, middle class, upper class, racialized black people feeling that way because of how pernicious race ideology is and because of the social class aspect of racism. And so I will say, although I can be met with um, a healthy amount of skepticism, I found that my methodologies are actually helping open the door to more people. Um, and that even though even my students have called it a spiritual, emotional, um, psychological, um, intellectual journey, which is code for, you know, it's really hard work. <laughs> Because you yes. basically have to, you know, change your own mind. Yes. Um, that most people end up finding it really compelling to the point where they end up having or adopting eliminativist philosophies about race coming out of coming out of, you know, whether it's a class or workshop or training, or at least being curious enough to explore and learn more, which is like, which is I think as an educator the one thing that I would hope for every single person is just don't shut the door on me because I sound crazy to you, you know, keep the door open and just go, go read the, the Carlos Hoyts of the world, right? Go read George Middleton, go read the body of literature that exists across all disciplines that shows how pernicious race ideology is and imagine a, a different path forward. And then, like you said, it's a choice, right? We're not forcing anyone right. to think a certain way and we're not telling people how to think or we're not telling people what to think. But with, I think with the right information, most people's minds really unlock to the possibility of what we're talking about here. Most people do. And, and you, the strength in your approach <clears throat> Uh, that I that I uh, definitely resonate with is that you come in with an inherent perception of objectivity. Uh, typically in uh, most race, quote unquote, race trainings, cultural sensitive trainings, bias workshops, uh, the diver diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, we've shared this before. You, you'll get one person who identifies as black another person identifies as white and they're co-trainers uh, and they've, they've taken sides, uh, which that automatically is going to be bring in, you know, there's resistance in the process anyway. It's, it's, this it just is right. But when you can present yourself in a credible and objective manner, 
it doesn't mean that they're going to just automatically accept everything. But you've taken out the major wind in their sail for resistance. They have to really work hard to find something to resist to. And if you're coming across, if you add to that level of objectivity, no judgment, you know, reasoning, respect, uh, you're leaving that person who really wants to fight with you, you're leaving him with nothing. Right. And so that that is the 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 number one powerful most powerful component in your approach is you're already coming in in a perception of no sides you asked mm. me you asked me uh what benefits do i perceive from taking a a, a transcend a transcendent approach to the ideology <clears throat> Once I learned the objective facts about race, the ideology, coming from a mental health perspective, I knew that I had to start decolonizing my mindset because race is an ideology of colonialism. Uh, and so as long as I've been doing this work, I still have to do work on a daily basis to identify that. Now, when I say this, again, it's not to judge or criticize the European or the colonizers. Uh, I, I'm, I don't get into the was it right or was it wrong. Who's right? I let people just determine their own moral platforms. So I have my personal opinions, but I'm not here to share my personal opinions. Uh, so but I'm I'm not blaming the Europeans, so to speak, for being this bad, awful person, right? There is merit to their, their experience. They, people do what they do based on their experiences. So uh, what's, what I focus on is, is the fact of what people do. And that the fact is that race was created by the European for the justification of the transatlantic slave trade. Once I realized that, that means that anything coming from that ideology cannot mean anything of a positive or unifying nature. It only is for the purpose of division, exploitation, and economic greed. And again, not criticizing it, it's just, uh, just objective facts. History supports what I'm saying. You can. Current day supports what I'm saying, okay? Um, and often what people do is when they hear that, they, they take it personal and say, well, hey, I didn't have ancestors. I didn't have slaves. I didn't, I did, wasn't me. I wasn't, you know, okay, fine. You know, no one's accusing you of that. Acknowledging the history is not synonymous with blaming you current day. So for me, once I learned to start decolonizing my mindset, it made me less reactive. It has helped me in a number of, number of ways. It made me less reactive to all things racial. When a person tries to use a, a racial tactic with me, uh, I, I don't have an instantaneous reaction. I can sit back and assess and analyze and say, you know, where's this person coming from? What's the person's approach, right? Is it worth my time to even reply? If I reply, what's the best? You know, I'm going to take my time. I'm, I'm not going to just have a knee-jerk reaction. It's empowered me. Uh, race ideology works on a very subconscious perspective. There are many studies out there that show the mindsets associated with the Black identity versus the white identity. One of the most early and famous ones is the doll test. Kids as young as three and four know where on the hierarchy, skin color, the value of skin color rests. Uh, so it's, it's kind of futile for people to try to have a, a fake objective debate about, well, you know, black can be equal to white. No, it cannot. In race ideology, black cannot be equal to white. I love the term that you use, uh, reconstructionist. And that's what that's what really 
from Malcolm X to Martin Luther and, and before and on up to Kendi, uh, they they fall more into the reconstructionist lane of, of demanding equality from a, another racial group. It's a, it's a nice try. You know, you can continue with that line. Keep, keep, I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying chances are it's 2022. If you think you're going to get the white identity on a collective level to systemically in education, in housing and loan, in law enforcement, incarceration, employment, startup capital, public health and safety, if you think that you're gonna get a collective response from the white identity to treat black equal, I don't have, I don't have a name for that condition, but go ahead and try. <laughs> go ahead and try. For, for me, the benefit is I've, I've opted out of that dynamic because it's like it's like the uh, uh, the uh, what am I trying to say the uh, where people go to to gamble. What's that called? The casinos, mm -hmm. the casino, the house always wins. <laughs> and in race ideology, black never wins. And people mistake. Well, we can live together. We can eat together. We can we can do this. You know, we can work and. That's not what race is about. Race, isn't, race is not about whether you like somebody or not, whether you live together or not. Race is, a, race is about the maintaining of the hierarchy of color. Yes, we can be nice. We can get along. We can go to the games together. We can get married. We can have kids together. That doesn't change the hierarchy of the ideology. And that's where people get it mixed up. They feel like, well, I... I'm a Christian. I love my brother. You know, I, 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 you know, I make sure that I don't judge you on your skin color. And I, you know, in America, we all have the God given right to not like anybody. We don't want to like for any reason whatsoever. That's not illegal. That's human nature. And for me, I don't care. You know, it's nice to be like, but that's not my goal is not for you to like, my goal is to establish my uh, goals and, and, and assertions and achievements and inspirations as good or better as the next man. And, wow. and, and, and to not be, have an extra layer of encumbrance of a silly thing like a physical appearance to put, be put into systemic practice. I'm paying taxes and you're paying taxes. And because of my, my melanin count, st statistically speaking, I'm getting less bang for my buck for the tax dollars that I pay. You know, my, my Angelo is known for a quote, <clears throat> a very powerful quote, only friends can be equals. And in race ideology, if two, pe two, two couples, a black couple, quote unquote, and a white couple go to the same bank with the same credit score and the same earning power, statistically speaking, the black couple always comes out paying twice as more or is more likely to be rejected. So even if they're living next to the same white couple, they're paying more. Is that a friend? I don't think so. So to, to your point, George, um, Carlos Hoyt, another friend of mine, he talks about how racial equality is an oxymoron because the entire premise of that which is perceived to be racial is inequality. Um, and I think because we've mentioned his name a couple of times, I want to bring up something that I saw earlier. So there's this book. Um, I, it's, it's a relatively recent book. It is sponsored. So it's somebody's paying for ads on Amazon. So it popped up randomly on my feed. And the book's title is How the Word is Passed, 
by Clint Smith. And the review, one of the reviewers of the book and on the front cover is Ibram X. Kendi. And in quotations, he says, we need this book. So I look at the back cover and this is what Kendi wrote. Clint Smith chronicles in vivid and meditative prose his travels to historical sites that are truth telling or deceiving visitors about slavery. Humans enslaved black people and then too often enslaved history. But how the word is passed frees history, frees humanity to reckon honestly with the legacy of slavery. We need this book, end quote. Now, <laughs> why am I reading a book review by um, Abram X. Kennedy? Well, a couple of things based off of what George just said. So in the review, he writes, humans enslaved black people. Okay, so <laughs> okay, I mean, so George yes. is laughing. Maybe some other people in the audience are picking up what I'm putting down too, mm -hmm. right? So even subconsciously, as George was saying, the hierarchy that is built into race ideology that gets carried through race language shows up in Kendi's words, yes. where humans not being racialized there, so. We're supposed to presume whiteness because the absence of race, mm, right? Go, go with that. Go ahead, doctor. Go ahead. <laughs> so we're supposed to presume that the humans are white, which is also how problematically racelessness gets conflated with white, which is how problematically freedom from racism gets conflated with white. But then Black people who were initially racialized as Black and written outside of humanity is separate even in Kendi's own words here from the humans that he's talking about in terms of who enslaved so-called Black people. And so subconsciously, we have thinkers who are al aligned with the sort of reconstructionist efforts of Kendi and plenty of others before him whose very language upholds the same thing they are presumably striving against, which is that of racism and the hierarchy that race ideology dictates for all of us, so that freedom from racism and racelessness continue to get locked up with the category of white, presumed to be only applicable and accessible to then people racialized as white, and people racialized as Black, there's a way in which even the most well-intentioned, you know, of people talk about racialized Black people in a way that puts them and marks them as outside of human. And um, I think it is that subconscious aspect of an impact of race ideology that we're both pointing to and that we're both helping people grapple and wrestle with for themselves, right? You don't do it for anyone else. You don't do it, um, as you said, because you want people to like you or anything. It has nothing to do with that. It's about being more clear-eyed about who you are and how you are. And by extension, you can extend that grace to your neighbor which makes me think about the other aspect that you were highlighting, which is this idea of coming in from a place of objectivity and not coming in from a place of I'm already, I've already taken a side, right? I think there's something, there's something that underpins this desire to moralize everything. I don't know if that's actually a word, moralize. It is now. Um, to, to make everything about the battle of good versus evil yes, when it comes yes. to other humans. Because yes. ultimately, as, as you were telling the Confederate flag story, you can have a Confederate flag. You can love it. You can revere it. It can be the symbol of all things of good in the world to you. And that, to my mind, does not automatically mean that you are an evil, vile human being. Right. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you're racist but you can be racist and still be a good person a good right person. You, yes. you can have just like you can have any other character flaw that we could name mm -hmm. and still mm -hmm. be a good person and a work in progress a, a first draft as my friend angel eduardo says i feel like when it comes to race ideology when it comes to talking about racism and really getting to the root of it that's where much of the discourse and efforts fall short for me because it, it has 
it, I think it's always been this way, but I think it just seems exacerbated because of social media and things like that. But it's really about taking sides. If you are if you are perceived to be on the wrong side, people will try to get you fired. People will fire you. You know, mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. all kinds of ramifications for having racist ideas. When I think it actually makes perfect sense why most people have racist ideas in the first place, given the fact that race ideology is part of the belief system of the nation. Right. And so long as it continues to be part of the belief system, it's part of the education system. We teach our children from a very young age. Doc, and Doc go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we teach our children from a very young age. And so how can we expect people to just magically wake up one day and see themselves, see the, themselves and the problem and their fellow humans beings as clearly as possible when we teach them to have a cloudy view of themselves and other people based on racialization. Um, And I think that's one of the more pernicious aspects of all of this is we continue to convince ourselves that racial equality is possible. We continue racial, racial reconciliation is the other buzzword or term Mm -hmm. that gets thrown around. And it's so oxymoronic to me because when you are privy to the kind of information that you and I have, for example, you come to recognize that it it is an impossibility. And and then all of a sudden it actually seems more possible to do something different than than, than it seems to do the same thing as you were saying repeatedly and expecting a different result. so now, yeah, you, you see this right here. <laughs> Th- this is in your honor. <laughs> we can just go home now. <laughs> well, before we do exactly that, I want to invite you to say any last words of wisdom or anything that you want to share with people. You know, how could people find you? I'm definitely going to share the links to George's books and um, social media platforms in the description box after we conclude here, so you'll be able to. Um, access the brilliance of his mind and um, his processes afterward, which I think is beneficial to all of us. Um, But what do you want to leave listeners with? Well, with, with a sense of hopeless hope, hopefulness and empowerment, there's a shift of consciousness in, in the country. People really, for the most part, want to fix this problem. They're looking for leaders to do that. And this won't be solved by the traditional leadership model where one person alone, I alone can fix it. It's not gonna be that type of of, uh, model of solution. It's gonna be the model that I'm I'm really grateful to you for, which is, spearheading a collaborative initiative, uh, bringing in like-minded people to work together collaboratively. There is a place to go now. There are places to go now. And systemic issues require systemic solutions. One individual is not a system. And so, I, I want to commend you, Dr. Mason, for having the heart and the mind to create this community and inviting me in, right? And inviting me in, which I'm really appreciative of because that's the goal of my work. My, my work, my goal is to be of support to other organizations, whether they're directly working on race or just trying to fix issues in the workplace. I'm trying to come in and be a collaborative support for whatever that mission is. I'm, I'm not for everybody. So, you know, the, the, I, you know, my feelings won't be hurt if you say, you know, well, that George guy is okay, but thanks, but no thanks. But where I can fit in, I want to try to get in. And I'm, I'm challenging everyone out there who's listening. Get in this community, connect with Dr. Mason, fig, you know, be a part of the solution. There's no in-betweens. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. My father used to say, and I call my father with no uh, formal education whatsoever in his life from his experiences, I call him the smartest man in the world. And one of the quotes that I use from him is, 
he would tell me all the time, son, no decision is a decision. And a lot of people today want to opt out of this conflict. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And there is a community available for you if you're authentically wanting to be a part of the solution. Right here is the community for you to come in and join. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, George. We should definitely do this again and soon. To everyone who joined us for the live stream, thank you so much. I love seeing you all sound off in the chat box. And to everyone else, welcome. Come back, subscribe, like, stay a while. I see y'all out there watching. Join the community, as George said. Um, 